So good morning, everyone, and welcome to day two and to this panel. I am absolutely delighted um, to welcome our three panelists today, Pete Driscoll, Steve Pekin, um, and Nick Morgan. So, so Pete, let's, let's start with you. Um, the 2020 exam priorities were published in January, so can you touch on um, some of those and also talk about the changes from 2019 to 2020? Sure, thanks. Uh, first, um, thank you everyone for, for one, being here and for having us here. Um, you know, these are my views and not the views of the commission, likewise with Steve. Don't you wish they were the views of the commission? Uh, I need a coach though, so that's <laughs> right. Um, the, um, so, so in terms of priorities, we ended up publishing our priorities for the eighth year. Um, you know, it's a theme that I hope that you all are seeing in terms of us being more transparent about what we put out. Um, last year, we also did eight risk alerts um, in addition to the priorities, and we're really trying to get more information out to you all to help you do your jobs. Um, you know, we'll talk a little bit about coverage later, but, you know, we see that as a good vehicle to share with you all findings that we've, we've observed in exams and to help promote compliance in the industry. Um, the priorities is, is the same way. You know, we're, we're, it's becoming a more and more robust document as we've developed it out. Um, we're trying to address more areas um, and, and, and let folks know what we believe to be higher risks or areas of focus for us. And, you know, this year, um, it, you know, with the last several years, as, as OC has always driven, is, you know, focused on retail investors. That's very important to us. We also, you know, cover the markets in terms of our broker-dealer program um, and exchange program, our clearing program, and our technologies controls program, which focuses on cybersecurity, information security, um, res resiliency. Um, you know, in terms of big things that, you know, we're going to continue to focus on fees and expenses. It's, it's a mainstay for us. Focus on compliance programs. Um, we're also um, continuing to do private fund exams. It's something that we, we have a private fund unit. It's our only unit. Um, it's something that we still focus on. Um, and, and, you know, what we found is I think you know, close to half of the registered investment advisors manage some sort of private fund. And so that is something that we continue to, to, to look at as part of our exam and risk process. Um, you know, areas that will continue to focus on are robo-advisors, uh, you know, electronic investment advice. I bucket this group into um, folks that are, it's another, you know, style of our offering to a client base by firms that have robust compliance, legal, and risk programs. Um, and then there's another category of firms that are startups and technology-based that aren't terribly familiar with uh, the federal securities laws and the requirements that we have. And so, um, you know, there, we see risks there, and so that's an area that we'll focus on. Um, you know, we're looking at ESG. Um, it's something that I think you know, I saw an ad recently for an ESG style that in the fine print, it was very fine print, um, basically it said we could invest up from 0.00001% up to 0.99999%. And that was an ESG style. And so, and, and, and so, you know, we're worried about, you know, if someone claims they're ESG, are they really ESG? Are they taking the S&P and pulling out three or four securities and then calling themselves or branding themselves as an ESG? Um, you, you know, investment style or manager. And so we're looking at that. Um, obviously, Reg BI, um, Form CRS, those are big things for us. Um, I know this is the IAA, so BI is, is, is applicable to the um, broker-dealer world, but it's something that, um, you know, we, we're working on risk alerts um, on how we'll, we will conduct those exams after the effective date, which is July 1st. Um, included in that risk alert, which will hopefully be out this month, will include a sample request list of what we're going to ask for, because I think that that would be helpful for everybody that that applies to. Um, and then also with Form CRS, we're going to be providing guidance on how we intend to, to examine for Form CRS. Um, 
You know, I think big picture, I can share with you that the intent here for, for our Reg BI exams will be looking at implementation beginning in July going forward. Um, we won't be looking at trading likely until, you know, January or uh, I shouldn't even say January, the winter of 2021. Because th by that time, there'll be a, a healthy enough population of, of trading at firms um, to, to start you know, ingesting that into our analytics tools that we have for, for trading. So um, cybersecurity, we put out a cyber statement less than a month ago. Um, we're looking at cybersecurity in all five of our program areas. Um, and, and it's something that you know, that the cyber statement was different than a risk alert. We've put out around eight risk alerts in cybersecurity over the last several years. Um, the statement we thought was a good way to put out there what, what are some of the better practices we've seen. And we hope that you all find that helpful. And, you know, that's a model that we hadn't really done before. Um, and so, you know, I'm hoping that we can put out statements like that in addition to the risk alerts to, to help you all in, in your roles. because. Because again, you know, who's the victim in a cybersecurity breach? Is it the firm? Is it the underlying client or investor? You know, is it employees? It can be a number of folks, and so um, you know, those are those are complex issues that we're trying to just provide as much information about best practices and the pendulum. And I know that there's not a one size fits all. Um, smaller firms, um, may, you know, they may have a part time IT person. They may not have a cybersecurity. Um, person on staff and, and so um, and getting responsiveness from third parties who, who maintain that that can be a challenge and we've met with smaller firms about you know those concerns um, but we thought that it was helpful to put that information out um, alternative data um, you know it's not just in the private fund space it's something that we're focused on um, I'm hearing more and more from CCOs of large fund complexes that um, they're getting requests to purchase alternative data. And, and look, there's nothing wrong with alternative data. It, you know, if firms want to spend the money, I shouldn't say there's nothing wrong with it. The, the, alternative there's data can be a there. very <laughs> good thing. There can, um, there can be things yeah, wrong this, with this, alternative exactly. data. <laughs> the use of it. Um, but, you know, I, I think overall, alt data, if a firm wants to spend additional resources to get further information to make a, a more informed investment decision for their clients, that's an inherently good thing to do for your client. The challenge we have is, is where the data came from, is it material non-public information, was it obtained reasonably, um, and so, you know, we're looking at, it, it's really exploding, it's supposed to double in usage this year. Um, and it's becoming more and more mainstream in the, in the investment management world. So we're going to spend some time, we are spending some time doing exams in that space. So that's a new one for us. Um, race to zero commissions, um, you know, is, is it free? Um, you know, I'm waiting for the first firm to, to come out with the slogan, you get what you pay for. You know, it'll be kind of interesting, but we're looking at, you know, how are firms making up for not charging commissions? You know, cash management, um, exchange rebates, um, that's a space for us. Odd lots is another area that we're focused in the broker-dealer program. Um, you know, as the price of securities go up and there's fewer splits, is there um, pricing issues, manipulation in, in trading of odd lots? So that's something we're focused on in the broker-dealer program. <laughs> Um, also, central risk books, central risk desks at firms. Originally, you know, firms put together a central risk desk that would manage risk throughout multiple trading strategies at firms. And the concern we have there is that they're starting to turn into profit centers. And are they using or misusing the information they're getting from different strategies to disadvantage certain clients? Um, over others, and so that's a space where that's new this year that we're going to focus on. And so with that, I'll stop.
That's great, and we, we're going to want to drill down deeper into a lot of these issues. Um, I just I had, Pete, a couple of things you said caught my ear. One, uh, ESG, obviously a big, big deal. I understand uh, examiners are asking questions about that. Uh, Commissioner Pierce has been critical of the whole concept of ESG, primarily because it's so poorly defined. And I know one of the things your staff will be looking at is if we're making representations about activity in ESG, are they accurate? Is there a benchmark that you're aware of that someone could go to and say, well, this is what ESG means? Because I think definitions here will be a real big problem. And I mean, what's funny is if you go from firm to firm, I think you've hit on the issue is that different firms define what they do um, as ESG differently. And it, you know, I don't think it's for us to decide what that definition is. We're looking, to your point, at disclosures of what they say they're doing right. versus what they're actually doing. And yeah. so, um, and I know there, there, there's some standards that are out there that if a, if a firm says they're, you know, trading in, 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 in to the guidance that's already been published in certain realms, right. that they're in fact doing that. Right. So. And then on the alt data uh, point, um, and I, we could obviously do a whole panel on that, but you, right. you mentioned uh, issues around acquisition of alt data. Was there, are there particular things in, in, that you have in mind when you talk about trouble areas around acquisition? I know there's you know, website scraping, there's uh, communicating with insiders, right. but are there particular issues on alt data that are giving heartburn to the staff? You know, those exams are early on. Um, it, you know, I think that if you look to where the data is coming from, if, is it publicly available or is it from a firm that's getting it in a, in, in a reasonable and legitimate way? Um, you know, if they're dropping off a bag of cash at a shipping manager's desk and, you know, asking for shipping manifest, that would be Not an good. objection. A red flag, thing. yeah. So, but. Thanks. I appreciate so there's that. There's also an interesting interplay, obviously, right, with alt data and privacy, all the privacy rules that are that are coming up. Is that something that you're um, going to be attentive to and, and looking at? You know, that's a great point. And one thing I, I should have said is, is we're also looking at how firms sell their client data. And is it something that the client has agreed to? Is it something that clients are aware of? Um, you know, that's a fear that we have that you know, firms are misusing the data and, and making money off their clients' information um, without telling their clients. And so, so yeah, that does hit the privacy piece. Yeah. So, Steve, how about you and the um, priorities for the enforcement division and whether you've been seeing over the last year or so any trends in the um, investment advisor space? Sure. I mean, look, we have a pretty broad landscape to cover um, in the enforcement division. And I think if you look year over year, the mix of cases really there's probably not as much variation um, you know we can't say this year you know what we're not interested in valuation cases right we're not interested in, in fraud and misappropriation of assets we're always going to do those kinds of things um, I think the one trend that is at least emerged um, you know it obviously comes um, uh, closely related to our share class selection disclosure initiative is conflict of interest disclosure around fees um, and that's a space where I think we're looking at, um, you know, not just in the mutual fund uh, space, but also um, UITs. We brought a case against um, disclosure, uh, conflict of interest in selection of classes of UITs, um, cash sweeps, um, and revenue sharing. And I think if you look out over, project over the next year or so, um, I expect to see, you know, enforcement recommendations, um, hopefully cases also, um, in all those spaces. So that's really, I think, um, if that was the one area that folks in this room should be, you know, attentive to, I think it's it's that in particular. So the, the, I'd like to talk a little bit more about the share class selection initiative um, in, in a bit, but generally in terms of your resources, I mean, that's obviously a super efficient use of resources. Um, can you talk a little about how your division is thinking about resource allocation and how it would approach another kind of initiative along those lines? Yeah, so I mean, look, we've been resource constrained uh, pretty much the entire time I've been sitting in this uh, in this seat. Um, we had a hiring freeze that came into play in 2016, and um, we couldn't backfill against departing employees, and there was enormous attrition um, over that period, natural attrition, um, but we lost in the enforcement division between contractors and um, full-time you know, employees. I think we lost you know almost 200 people. Um, 
So uh, we got uh, authority this past April to replace uh, to backfill against the party employees, and we've gotten over the last two years um, authority in the enforcement division to hire, um, I think, about um, probably north of 50 uh, new employees. So we're climbing back, but we're still meaningfully below um, the staffing levels that we were at, uh, you know, in 2016. So, um, you know, how do you how do you uh, account for that? I mean, I think one thing is to try to find leveraged um, strategies like share class uh, self-reporting strategy. That's one thing. Um, I think more significantly, though, we've been focused on case selection. Um, so, you know, there's a hierarchy, obviously, of the kinds of violations that we can investigate. Um, you know, last year. The agency got over 20,000 tips, complaints, and referrals. So we don't spend a lot of time, you know, worried about business generation. Um, it's kind of there for the taking, um, and we try to figure out, you know, obviously not all 20,000 of those uh, merit investigation, but you know, we're only running between 1,500 and 2,000 investigations at a time. So how do we figure out what we're going to do? And I think we've tried to be thoughtful um, about, um, you know. So if, for example, you know, there's an exam and um, a deficiency letter is written and the issue is corrected um, and there's no customer harm, that's a case that you know, in a more resor less resource-constrained area, uh, era, perhaps there might have been enforcement action. That's not something you know, that is particularly appealing for us to devote resources to. How the cases come to you and, and your decisions around um, when you make recommendations to the commission, um, what's the biggest source of, of your cases? Is it tips and referrals or is it exams? So in the, in the IA space, um, it's, I, I think, you know, and this isn't a scientific study, but certainly impressionistically it's exam, um, it's exam referrals. Um, and Pete can tell you exactly what the percentage of um, you know, exams lead to a referral, um, but you know that number? Uh, this past year it was six percent. Yeah. Okay. So, um, and I think we're we're getting you know high quality um, you know referrals from from the exam program. Um, you know the way we're structured uh, outside of, of the home office um, in our regions, our regional director oversees obviously as you know both the exam program and the enforcement program. So there's you know pretty close you know coordination there. And I think we've um, I think we've refined down the. Um, the referral process um, so that we're accepting a pretty significant percentage of the referrals that are being made. It, 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 can I touch on that yeah, just because yeah. I think it's relevant? You know, I think that OC is is worked harder to get remedies and get relief on a voluntary basis by working with firms, particularly when we identify, you know, overbilling or misbilling of, of clients, lack of refunds, certain things that we may ask for the firms to remediate um, as part of the exam process and the deficiency letter process. And so one of the things we track is, is recoveries. And I think this year we had close to 80 million in, in recoveries. Um, and that's just through um, going through in, 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 in the deficiency letter process. And, and you know, particularly if we've identified something that's pretty clear case that you know, the investment contracts say that you know, you're know you supposed to bill at 1% of AUM and you're billing at 2%. And, and you know it, it's something that we can quickly get the refunds back into the investor's hands and the client's hands. And, and, and that's a win for us in terms of, um, I think it's a win for your firm to get it remediated, but I also think it's a, it's a win for, for the investor, which I think is really important, so. Pete, the uh, receipt of a deficiency letter obviously is a big deal for an advisor uh, and a referral to the enforcement division is an even bigger deal. Um, it looks like there were about 2,000 deficiency letters last year, according to the SEC's reports, and year in, year out, there are about 150, I think last year, 160 the year before, of referrals to the enforcement division. What role does a firm's willingness to remediate, as you say, play in either getting a deficiency letter or avoiding a referral? So um, in, in terms of, so the, the numbers, yeah, we do around 21, 2200 IA deficiency letters. As a whole, we did over 
3,000 exams last year. Um, the bulk of those exams do receive a deficiency letter. Some are no comments, but um, yeah, I, I don't know the exact number. Maybe 10% or something like that is, is a no comment letter. Um, as we do more initiatives to gather information for informing policy, you know, th there, that may trend up or down depending on what we have going in a particular year. Um, you know, the one thing that I think, um, it, it, and we can talk more about, you know, what, for us, what, what is something that we want to refer. Um, I think recidivist activity, when we go into a firm and, you know, they blew the custody rule in 2016, and then we go back in in 2019 after they told us that they would come into compliance with the custody rule, and they blow it again. Um, and this time it led to harm where, where clients were disadvantaged somehow uh, or money dissipated by a, a rogue rep. And you know, those are areas that we're going to kick that to enforcement. Um, that, that, that's something that, you know, if a firm, if we've identified something and a firm says they're going to fix it and they don't fix it, um, and it just is really bad. And so, and, and, and particularly if it leads to harm to an investor or a client. Um, certain things just based on magnitude and, 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 you know, things that we identify that we believe to be a material breach of the federal securities laws, we'll kick that over. Um, obviously, the misappropriations, the, you know, if, if, it's, if it's a significant, you know, and sometimes we can identify through email, it's an intentional scheme to overbill clients or, you know, if it's an instance where, you know, a firm overbilled clients, and some clients told the firm, say, hey, you're overbilling me, and they still overbilled other clients, you know, knowing that they may have had an issue. That's something we're going to refer. Um, so those are examples of, you know, areas that, that, that we would refer over. Um, so it sounds like the willingness to remediate may or may not be a factor in the referral. It, it depends. Yeah. It depends on the magnitude of, of, of what our findings are. I mean, I think oftentimes, you know, I, sometimes we'll wait to see how the firm um, remediates uh, a deficiency and in, in determining whether or not it makes sense to still pass that on to enforcement. Um, oftentimes, I think if firms say, you know what, you know, our systems were off and, you know, we, we fixed it, we've reimbursed clients. That may be an instance where we talk with enforcement about it, but I think that that is a, a very strong mitigating factor of whether or not we refer. So, so if you, let, let's stay on resources for a while um, because, you know, as, as you've said, the advisor industry is growing. Um, each year we're seeing more and more SEC registered advisors. Um, the IAA is a st strong supporter and we always have been of a very robust exam program and, and we believe that um, you should have the resources to really be able to do, do, um, you know, do the program effectively and efficiently. Um, but you've expressed <coughs> excuse me, some questions about resources and about your ability to have coverage going forward. Can you talk a little bit about that and about whether there are particular areas that you think um, you, you would need more resources and whether there are ways that you could improve your program with the resources that you have? So we've, we've done a good job about trying to do process improvements both through our exam process as well as through technology um, as well as you know, improving our risk-based approach. Um, you know, we, we, in, if, if you saw our priorities this year, um, we included a discussion about coverage. And, you know, two years ago, we, we were able to get our coverage up to 17% um, without um, sacrificing quality. And um, part of that was moving around 100 staff into the IAIC program from other programs that we have. Um, and then last year, it dipped a little because of the shutdown. I mean, we do exams every month, and you take us out for 35 days with the lapse in appropriations. We're not going to do as many exams. We still, you know, we, we only dipped about 3%, but combine that with the growth in the IA population, you know, we covered around 15%. And, you know, what's the right magic number? I, you know, I don't, I don't think that we have that, and you know, I could speculate, um, but I do think that it, you know, it has to be over 15%. Um, 
Now, it, it's something that, you know, you know, folks at the agency have talked about, I've talked about with Jay, and I don't know how much more we can squeeze out of our program without sacrificing quality, and I think it was important to message that. Um, there's certain things that we're trying to do to, to leverage um, coordinating more with other regulators. Um, so a few of you may have seen that we're, we're, we're testing doing some joint exams with FINRA, um, where FINRA staff will look at a broker-dealer and we'll look at the IA at the same time. The thought is, is to, to minimize disruption at a firm where FINRA goes in and then two months later the SEC is showing up. And so um, we're doing some of those. We're going to start doing some coordinated exams with the NFA as well for duly registered firms um, with, 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 with on both sides. Um, you know, I do think that our initiative process where we've you know, put together an initiative um, uh, on a key risk area identified a number of firms throughout the country. Um, I think we've really been able to leverage efficiency by, by moving to that model. I think 50% of our exams, roughly, um, are covered by national initiatives, and we've found that to be very effective. And what's great about that for you all, besides the fact that you get examined by us, is that we typically put out a risk alert at the end of that initiative, you know, letting you all know you know, what we found, because we think it's important for, if we do 100 exams or 50 exams and we have certain findings that are pretty common throughout the majority of firms, sharing that information with you all, so you can take that back to your own firm and say, okay, this is what the SEC has found, this is what they feel is important, we gotta make sure we clean this up within our own, own org, so. Yeah, and I think you've made, um sort of very clear your view that um, it, of how important it is to empower compliance professionals um, and, and to have them be maybe not an, not an enforcement partner for sure, but, but a, a compliance partner um, of, of the exam program. Um, so I don't know if you want to sort of say, so you've, you've got a room full of compliance professionals, whether you want to say a word here about um, sort of in helping, having OC help empower them um, so, so that they're sort of partners in compliance with you in a way and, and um, you know, how, how that sort of all fits in with the, um, you know, exams are about trying to get things better and not, not get things caught, right? Not Re realistically, you know, we're responsible for around 30,000 entities. We have 1,000 examiners, we work in teams, we do around 3,000 exams a year. So we're getting to about a tenth of our overall population. And if you look at the complexity of those types of firms, the largest clearing agencies, um, it includes all the exchanges, large broker dealers, mutual fund complexes, private fund advisors. So there's a lot of sophisticated players in that, in that bucket that we're responsible for. And so for us to get information out to um, the industry, particularly with risk alerts, I mean, we have, I, I wrote down eight quick risk alerts that we have in the pipeline. BI and CRS are coming very soon. Um, fixed income cross trading is very close. Cryptocurrency, um, digital assets, we have a risk alert coming out that that's, that's probably the next one to go out for us. We're looking at one in LIBOR because we see a lot of risk in LIBOR. Um, alt data, um, we've talked about that, but we're hoping to put out a risk, a lot, a risk alert there. Top find, findings in the compliance space, and then a private funds top findings. Um, that's something that we've been getting a lot of asks from compliance officers for private fund advisors that, hey, we haven't seen you know a risk alert on top findings in the private fund space, and so um, we're working on a, 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 a significant risk alert there. So, and we feel that that's important because we can't get to everyone, and um, I know you're all smiling, um, but it's something that we're trying to um, you know, get the word out because I think it's important for ultimately the investor we protect. So um, I will say that, that based on just speaking to our members, the risk alerts are very much appreciated because they, they help set some guardrails and guideposts for, for folks to, to see your thinking and to help them with their, with their program. So, so keep them coming, please. Um, I'm going to take one question out of turn and just talk for a second about the coronavirus. Um, a question that, <coughs> excuse me, that came up yesterday. Really <laughs> great, I have great timing, I have great timing. Um, a question that came up yesterday um, was, 
you know, as everybody's sort of thinking about remote working and, and all that is, um, have you given thought to your exams, how, how you're responding to on the ground exams, and if you sort of have to go to some kind of remote working, if someone's in the middle of exams, what's, um, you know, how are they going to get in, in touch with their examiners, um, how much sort of leeway and flexibility are you going to sort of formally build in, are you going to put out any kind of guidance? So in terms of, of exams, I mean, the agency has overall protocols along with the federal government. Um, in, in terms of exams, I think, you know, we're, it, it, it's going to be a case-by-case -case basis. Um, you know, I think that depending on, you know, we're a national program and, you know, there's been cases of the coronavirus in, 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 in California and the West Coast. There's cases in New York. There's now cases here in Maryland, um, or not here, but in Maryland. Um, and, you know, it's something that we've been talking with our staff, um, you know, to the extent that an exam through correspondence makes sense, um, we'll certainly consider that, as we always do. Um, you know, but I do think that there are instances where we're still going to have to go out on site. And, you know, working with firms, you know, trying to coordinate with their own protocols, We've seen um, some really good examples of, of firms and approaches they've taken um, to help, you know, be careful within their own program and with their own employees to um, to try to minimize. Um, but at the same same time, you know, we have to still be effective and, and, and do our jobs. And so, you know, I I, I worry about the pretextual. Well. You know, you can't come in because of the coronavirus when we've received a tip that they've stolen money. And so that's just not going to work. And, and, and so, so I think, again, it, it will be case by case. Um, in terms of guidance, I mean, the only thing I would say is, 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 is that if there's concerns, talk with our folks. Um, we're humans, too. And it's, it's something that, you know, as, as this plays out. But, but I do think that the agency has strong protocols that it's implemented and we're working through them, so. So Steve, same question for you. Do you have humans in the enforcement division? <laughs> we do. We try to ask people to leave their humanity at the door, but, <laughs> but it's not always successful, so. Yeah. So with respect to subpoena deadlines and things like that, there might be some flexibility? Yeah, I mean, I think, look, this is, we're in uncharted territory here, right? And we don't know how, uh, we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, let alone two weeks from now, um, you know, I think that there's, um, obviously we're gonna have to be nimble and flexible, and I think that, you know, in general, um, you know, we're gonna be reasonable in the time of potential crisis. Um, but, you know, to date, we're moving ahead, um, marching forward. How long will it be until you see an offering fraud with the coronavirus cure? Yeah. So we've already suspended trading in, um, I think, two or three microcap securities claiming you know, baselessly the two of, you know, uh, coronavirus uh, uh, cures or remedies. Um, and, you know, that's not surprising. Every time something like this happens, you know, the um, kind of cockroaches come out from uh, under the couch, and um, this is no exception, so. Alleged cockroaches, I guess. Alleged. <laughs> so turning from... I mean, from... coronavirus cure. <laughs> <laughs> He's, he's comfortable. He's, he's right, staying right. with that. He's, he's okay staying with, the with that. Yeah. <laughs> the funny thing is, cockroaches will survive, but you know. Right. <laughs> so, from cockroaches to fiduciary duty, um, the fiduciary duty interpretation, Pete, um, has, has your priorities say that you've integrated that into your exam program. And um, what are you, um, how examiners examining differently following the interpretation? And are you seeing any changes? in advisors, sort of just generally speaking, in, in, in whether they've made changes like a, around disclosures um, following the interpretation? So yeah, so we, we have implement. I mean, we've spent a lot of time with BI implementation. And, and one thing I didn't mention in the resource um, segment is, is that uh, you know, when you mentioned resources and, you know, we're going to spend more time in the broker-dealer space with the implementation of BI. I think those exams are going to take longer, too. Um, I think that, like 20647 on the IA side, I think Reg BI is an underlying, um, you know, I guess, uh, well, rule um, that that will 
you know, when there's, say, a potential violation of, of the custody rule, there may be an underlying violation of 20647. They may have a weak compliance program. Um, I think similar sightings will happen in the Reg BI space where you may have an underlying violation, but then also it falls into the Reg BI category. And so that's something that, um, you know, we'll, we'll be spending more time in the broker dealer space with that. But to your question about the, the fiduciary duty, um, you know, the interp that, that, that went out, that's something we have implemented. You know, our examiners are looking at. Um, the investment decision making that's made and the evidence showing that you know this is this particular investment is in the best interest of its clients. Um, you know the duty to monitor is something we're focused on and and, and and looking at what firms are doing once they've made the recommendation and continuing to manage that client account. And then disclosures is is, is the other area that we're focused on. Um, but it is something that you know as we flush through it and. You know, to the extent that we can do a risk alert in this area, we're going to do one in BI, one in CRS. But um, you know, as we do do some of these exams, if we identify issues, you know, we'll likely put something out there too. So, yeah. and, and Steve, a similar question for you. So the interpretation spells out the duty of care with quite a bit of specificity. Um, are you? How are you thinking about that in terms of bringing enforcement cases? I think we don't think that the fiduciary interp broke any new ground. Um, and you know, if you look back at um, you know sort of the, at the specificity, the different types of things that Pete just articulated, I think we've brought cases in all those spaces historically. And so, you know, I think that the interp you know sort of categorizes and, and articulates in one place kind of stuff that has been I think accepted practice for some time. And so I don't think that we're seeing much of a change in the way we think about um, you know, advisors um, complying with their obligations, with their fiduciary obligations. I actually think that the, the INTERP is, is a great tool for compliance officers to use in their own organization to check through different things. I think Steve's absolutely right. Yeah, and I think we would agree for the record that we don't think that the INTERP broke new ground. Um, and, and you know what we've been sort of t telling our members is it's a great opportunity as with every time the commission makes a formal statement to go back and just look at your programs and, and make sure, just sort of revisit them with, with fresh eyes. Um, Nick, how about you? What are you seeing? Well, I don't think it'll have a practical impact on compliance uh, efforts, but the, there was a lot of hand-wringing about uh, and versus or on disclosure of conflicts of interest and whether the and or was avoid conflicts and disclose them or avoid conflicts or disclose them. And so uh, the issue has been, and so in this sense it has, is not a change, but the issue when it comes to defending certain practices is, are conflicts okay if they're sufficiently disclosed? Uh, so in other words, you, you don't need to avoid, the question is, you don't need to avoid all conflicts so long as they're appropriately disclosed. Um, I think the uh, Reg BI raises that issue, and I think we'll see that come out perhaps in uh, some of the defense of uh, enforcement matters. But for practical purposes on the compliance side, I think uh, the focus has always been on avoiding and disclosing. Um, so I don't think it'll change on the compliance end, but I think we may see some, um, well, I guess it's a continuation of arguments about whether sufficient disclosure cures uh, conflicts. And while we're talking semantics, um, we can talk about the use of the word may, Steve. So this is a good segue into the share class um, disclosure uh, selection disclosure initiative. Can you just give us an update on the status um, and whether we can expect to see any more settlements come out? So we brought 95 uh, ca cases against 95 advisors um, in the last uh, fiscal year, really principally, I think, in two waves. Um, you know, the self-reporting period ended um, you know, almost two years ago. I think there are a small number of additional self-reporting advisors whose settlements are <coughs> forthcoming um, you know, in the next you know, short period of time. But I think what you will see um, is cases um, you know, both litigated and settled against uh, advisors who were eligible to self-report but chose not to. And we've been, we have pretty good um, ability to identify people who were eligible to self-report and elected not to participate in the program. And obviously, um, you know, those people, to the extent that, you know, we believe enforcement action is appropriate, um, you know, we would recommend, you know, much more, uh, you know, harsher terms of, of settlement and seek more relief in litigation. 
the flip side, were, were there firms that came to you and self-reported and you did not recommend enforcement under the initiative? Sure. Yes. Can you give us an idea of how many and the kinds of factors that, that led you to make that decision? Um, I don't know exactly how many, um, but look, there were a number of arguments that we heard. People self-reported and then we gave them an opportunity to engage with us to explain why they didn't think enforcement action was appropriate. And in you know, not a de minimis number of cases, those arguments prevailed. And people um, persuaded us that you know, their, their disclosures were adequate. Um, uh, people persuaded us that, in fact, at the time of the underlying conduct or for a substantial period of it, there wasn't another um, share class available um, to them. Um, people uh, explained to us that their clients did um, ultimately better um, in the, um, in, through the share class selections that they made than they would have otherwise because of, say, offsets, et cetera. Um, and there were a small number um, where the firms had remediated and we found that um, there was a de minimis amount um, of, of uh, fees at issue and concluded that uh, action wasn't appropriate. So I would say that the things range from, you know, our disgorgement numbers. Um, we were persuaded to shrink the amount of, of disgorgement and remediation to cases where we um, declined entirely. I think that flows over on the OC side as well in terms of what we're seeing out in the field. Um, you know, with share class, we've built it into our analytics tool. So when we look at trade blot, or we're, it's just part of, it's another thing that we're looking at going forward. Um, you know, we, you know. I do know that in some instances where we we go out to a firm that has a number of reps, um, in an isolated incident, they have you know a, a recently converted registered rep to an IA rep, and they're still recommending those 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 funds. Um, if it's isolated, we don't believe it, it. It wasn't large dollars. We'll ask the firm to remediate, and if the firm remediates, fixes it, educates the, the, the isolated rep doing it, we'll likely not refer something like that. And so I, I think you're seeing, you know, I'm seeing improvements in our, on our side um, as we do exams, but we still find it. You're still seeing it. Yeah. So Nick, I'm, I'm really interested in your thoughts on self-reporting generally. Like, was it really a slam dunk? Um, under the, this initiative, and also what do you think about it just more generally when, I, I, I'm, I, I'm just assuming that we know what Steve thinks about self-reporting, that you're supportive of it generally. Yeah, we're in favor of people self-reporting There we go. Conduct. Um, there we go. So, so Nick, is it? Well, uh, so on the share class initiative, uh, you know, the, uh, one of the biggest critics I think was Commissioner Pierce, and one of her issues was that when you see a problem that's so widespread and it involves big actors, uh, and small, uh, but clearly um, uh, advisors who have put a lot of uh, attention on compliance issues and they're trying to get it right, um, that maybe when you see something that widespread, enforcement is not the best tool to address that issue. Uh, and I, I agree with that on, on this particular issue. Obviously it was successful, a lot of people self-reported, but perhaps there could have been a different way to go about it than um, uh, using the enforcement division to address it. So on share class initiative, the uh, decision to self-report or not was made easier by the incentives that were provided. Uh, self-reporting generally, uh, it'd be easy for me to say that it's, uh, you should report in all instances, but in fact, it's a very difficult decision. Uh, and unlike in the share class initiative situation, the incentives are not always clear. Uh, despite efforts by the division to make the incentives clear with um, beginning with the Seaboard report and other, other reports after that, trying to articulate what the benefits are. Um, but it's very hard to assess what the benefits are in a specific way. There's no um, guarantee that uh, penalties will be higher or, I mean, will be lower uh, after self-reporting. Um, there's, of course, when you self-report, you're, you're not ending the uh, engagement with enforcement. You're beginning the engagement with enforcement. They're going to conduct an investigation and not take your word for it. So it's a very difficult decision whether to self-report or whether to uh, self-remediate, uh, correct the problem, do, do all the things that presumably OC and the Enforcement Division would have you do in any event, remediate, correct your policies and procedures, do those things. Um, 
and once you've done them, it really is a difficult decision, and it's a case-by-case -case, uh, basis for deciding whether to self-report. Uh, so it's hard to do from the enforcement's division, but greater clarity on the uh, what the benefits are would be um, very useful in encouraging more self-reporting. Yeah, can, can I just respond just briefly to you know the suggestion that because the mutual fund share class selection was so widespread, it wasn't appropriate for enforcement action. I mean, there are thousands of uh, SEC registered investment advisors. There have been slightly more than 100 cases brought. That's a very small percentage of the industry. And if you look at the list of firms, while there obviously were some you know, large prominent firms, many of the large prominent firms do not feature in this space because they got this right. And the criticism that this was, it was so difficult for an investment advisor to understand that if I'm selling this bottle of water to my client and I have a choice of selling it to them for a dollar or a dollar fifty and getting part of that extra fifty cents paid back to me, that somehow that is shocking that that, that would be inappropriate. I, I mean, I have to tell you that that argument rang hollow with me. Um, and obviously, I, I don't mean to oversimplify um, this the issue, but um, I don't think the criticisms that somehow this is reg we're regulating by enforcement. Um, by telling a fiduciary that if you're gonna sell something to your client and there's two prices and you're picking the higher price, which reduces that client's returns because you're getting a share of the action, that that somehow ought to be disclosed, let alone prohibited. Like, I don't think that's um, a crazy, uh, you know, that's not wild-eyed wild enforcement run amok. Well, the other issue, uh, the other criticism is that, and I, I think that does over, oversimplify uh, what happened in a lot of instances, the disclosures were not uniform across the board, uh, and the products were not uniform across the board. So the other criticism is that by doing an initiative, it makes it appear as though there's some sort of uniformity of conduct, when in fact, if you look at the releases, there's all kinds of different conduct in there, Absolutely. but it suggests that sort of the, the best ones and the worst ones are all sort of lumped together. Yeah, and uh, you know, look, any initiative, I think, um, you know, there, look, there's a policy trade-off that you make in a self-reporting initiative. So you have to have carrots and you have to have sticks, right? And in this uh, initiative, um, you know, we forewent penalties um, in respect of conduct that had previously been the subject of a series of enforcement actions. Um, the theory behind the initiative was those actions before the initiative were taking, you know, two years to do. And, um, you know, I think there have been maybe half a dozen of them over a three or four year period. And then in a very short period of time, we were able to obviously get a, a sort of geometrically uh, increased number of, of firms to, um, you know, participate and remediate, not just historic, but also prospectively, right? Because, um, you know, firms are, um, I would say, you know, they're obligated to either fix their disclosures or fix their practices, and most firms have elected to basically fix the practice, not um, just fix the disclosure. We could spend the entire panel on this, but I have one, I, I do want to follow up on one thing you said, because I, I think it's, it's a question that I have, have, have asked a lot. Um, you said um, disclose or let alone, let alone prohibit. So can you just focus a little bit on the let alone prohibit piece of that? Um, you know, the, the, I think the appro OC's approach is do what you say you're doing, say what you do, right? Make, make those things consistent. Um, is it, would it be appropriate if you fully disclose a share class selection practice along the lines of what you've described um, and, and everyone could agree that your disclosure was absolutely adequate? Would that practice be appropriate in your view? It's a great question, um, and I don't think I know exactly the answer. Um, there's a serious question about whether it, you would be complying with your duty of care under the fiduciary um, you know, standard. Um, I think that, uh, you know, but I'll, uh, that's, that's as much as I think I'm prepared to say. So let's switch gears. And this Pete, do you want to? I agree. Yeah. Does anybody want to commit? Um, Okay, so let's switch uh, gears to Form CRS, and, and you touched on it a little bit before. Um, it's a brand new form. Um, advisors are working really hard to implement it. It goes into effect at the end of June. Um, are you going to sort of allow, for, <coughs> excuse me, for any kind of grace period um, that, that would sort of, when you go in and examine, or are you gonna find deficiencies sort of off the bat if the CRS isn't quite what, what you expect to see? Um, you know, I guess I'll start first by just making everybody aware, in case you're not, we've been trying to, to, to 
make sure folks are aware of that, that to the, as the compliance date um, approaches, to the extent that you have questions, we have a mailbox, IABD at SEC.gov. Um, if you have questions, I think that's what it is. Let me just make sure I get it right. Um, IABD questions at SEC.gov. There's a, a, a working group that meets on a weekly basis to address those questions, works on FAQs. Um, you know, as I mentioned, there's a risk alert that we have in the pipeline on CRS um, to help answer questions and talk about how we'll use that information and what we'll be looking for in those initial exams. Um, I sit on that committee along with, uh, an, uh, you know, Dolly is on the committee. There's a, there's a, you know, a number of, you know, folks from IMTM, OCGC that we're working. So, so to the extent you have questions or through council you have questions, you know, I encourage you to submit those because you know there is no cookie cutter. I think on this and 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 being able to for us to think about some of the challenges that you all are having as you implement, I think is really helpful for us as 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 we you know begin to use that information. You know, we'll we'll, we'll certainly use it right away in the um, in the risk based approach that we take. You know. Um, you know, we'll, our data analytics folks have already started, you know, talking about how they'll ingest that information and use it to help us identify exam candidates and things to focus on from a scope perspective. Um, you know, in terms of, I, I think that if, if firms don't file it, it's going to stick out. Um, so we will likely call you um, at a minimum if you don't file. And so, I'll start with that, um, but you know, in terms of the Reg BI and the Form CRS, the most important thing is that we all get it right. Um, so we want to do what we can to help with that implementation. So, you know, like I said it, previously in, in other contexts with Reg BI, you know, I think it's really important that um, we get these implemented and in place because I think overall. It can only help the retail investors. So, to the extent that there's areas that we can help answer questions on, I encourage you now to please submit those questions or call us. Um, but it's something that we, you know, we take very seriously and we meet weekly on it and try to solve some of the questions that people have. And so, so I'll just leave it at that. Okay. Yeah, that that's that's helpful. Um, you know, you also talked about um, cyber, and and it's obviously it, it's the biggest headache for com compliance folks, and it's going to be that for the foreseeable future. Um, is that part of um, every exam now? And then and then I guess I also have a question for Steve on this. If when you think about enforcement when there's been a cyber breach. Um, What's the rule of reasonableness there? Well, what is your expectation of firms? So let, let's start with Pete. So in terms of, you know, I mentioned earlier that around half of our exams are based on national initiatives, which is typically a discrete, limited scope area or two that we're focused on. So um, if, if the initiative is, is cyber-based, which we do have a cyber initiative going on right now, um, then, you know, cyber will be included. There's also built into our standard request list um, that examiners can use depending on the nature of the firm. Um, if it has a very strong web presence or um, you know, clients that access their account um, from externally um, you know, through a website, we may you know, work through that module that we have in, in, in our request list and, and, and in, our, in our exams. Um, but it's not, I'm not going to say that for 3,000 exams we're looking at cyber for everyone. We're not doing that. Um, what I will say is that all our program areas, the five program areas, are all doing something in the cyberspace. Um, you know, our TCP team, we've hired, I think we're up to seven ex CISOs at different firms that we've brought in internally um, to use as leverage to, to educate and help. Um, our IAIC examiners and our broker-dealer examiners execute out on certain cyber-related exams. Um, but again, we're trying to be, I mean, I think more than any other area, we're being very transparent in what we've done in the cyberspace, you know, since 2014. You know, our first initiative, we put out what we were going to look at, a sample request list, and then we reported out afterwards saying what we found, you know, for small, medium, and large firms. Um, because we get that, you know, 
in certain cases, um, you know, who's the victim is, is a tough thing to, 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 to determine. And, and, and then if we find egregious stuff, we go to Steve. And uh, you. <laughs> ah, okay. Sorry, I missed my line there. Um, so, look, I think if you just take a step back and look at the way um, our enforcement um, cases have addressed cyber breaches and cyber intrusions, um, I think we've been restrained. Um, you know, in the issuer space, um, the commission has brought one single case in its history um, against the against Altaba, um, the f which was formerly known as Yahoo, for failing to disclose a breach, and that involved, you know, egregious failure to even investigate, let alone disclose what was then the largest cyber intrusion in history. Um, in the registered um, space, there have been a handful, and the one I would refer you to is Voya Financial Advisors, um, where there was a cyber intrusion, um, and cyber criminals basically, you know, gained access to personally identifiable information for like over 5,000 clients, and because of deficiency in the procedures, of the firm's procedures, their access, the cyber criminals' access wasn't restricted. Um, and so the commission brought a case there alleging violations of uh, Reg SP and, and, and Reg SID. Um, but that has been a, and I think the lesson there is um, that, you know, the firms need to look and make sure that their procedures are adequate to respond to, not only to protect against the, uh, an intrusion, but also to respond uh, and remediate if such an intrusion occurs. But, you know, if you just take a half a step back, it's not as if we're adopting some kind of zero tolerance policy um, on uh, firms that are victimized by, by cyber criminals. What's been your experience, Nick, on that? Well, we've actually had a few clients ask us to do mock uh, cyber breaches. Uh, and so I think cyber probably falls into a gen more general category of terrible events that keep us awake at night and how do we prepare for those and there are you know cyber is just one of of many of those and so uh, having procedures in place and then uh, sort of testing those procedures and, and making sure they're up to snuff is sort of what what our clients are asking us to do but um, I agree with Steve the response has been pretty restrained and yeah. thoughtful from the enforcement division that makes me nervous <laughs> you're missing a lot Steve. Yeah. Sanjay do you have any questions from the audience uh, so, uh, so Pete, this uh, question probably for you. Uh, what do you plan to focus on with respect to with respect to fund liquidity programs? So I know IM has been focused on looking at fund liquidity. Um, this year, it's not in our priorities, and so I think I'll just leave it at that. So. Uh, and I got a couple of questions on. Uh, how, and I guess Pete, or from the exam perspective, you deal with foreign advisors, and are you, what are some exams that you're doing in that space? And then I guess, uh, Steve, is there any sort of enforcement initiatives with respect to foreign advisors? So foreign advisors, um, you know, we put in our priorities this year. Um, you know, concerns we have about blocking statutes and access to books and records for foreign registered advisors. There's around 1,000 um, foreign registered advisors that are registered with the SEC, um, that are located abroad. Um, in some, coming from some countries that um, we don't have trouble accessing books and records to do inspections. And, but you know, recent rulemakings, particularly in the EU, it's it, with GDPR, um, that's something that we've asked registering firms, newly registered firms, um, to provide a legal opinion as to whether or not um, when they, they sign a certification that says we will produce any and all books and records um, to any SEC office, loosely I, it says approximately that. Um, but basically, you know, we've asked them, well, how does that reconcile with GDPR? And, you know, it, 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 we haven't had a law firm be able to provide, or a registrant to be able to provide a legal opinion that they can do the, provide those records. Legally? Sorry, Pete, are you asking for a U.S. legal opinion or a, a U, an EU legal opinion? 
U.S. Council I, I don't know if we're, well, I don't know if we're differentiating okay. between the two. It, it's, we're asking the firm who's registering with us. Um, and so what we're doing is, is, is we have a few, te we, we've worked with European authorities and, and we're doing a few test exams um, right now um, to see if we can start clearing through different countries. Um, you know, where we can, in, in some, some countries are just governed by GDPRs, other countries have more restrictive um, privacy statutes that, that, that would inhibit us from doing an exam. And so, I mean, from a fairness perspective, does it really make sense for everybody in this room to be subject to an exam by OC, but if you're registered in a particular country, or from a particular country, and, and you know, that prevents you from being examined, is that really a reasonable, fair result? It, you know, it certainly raises concerns for us from an investor protection perspective. So, uh, but we're hoping to, to start clearing through different countries as we do test exams and, and working with regulators throughout the world. And for my part, we do have some pending investigations um, involving foreign uh, registered investment advisors, but um, there's no initiative and enforcement uh, to focus on those. Well, we're out of time, so um, I did set the bar pretty high in my intro, and I am willing to say that we met it. Um, so thank you, um, Pete, Steve, Nick, for a, a terrific panel. Um, many thanks. Thank you.